Okay, everybody, let's get started then. Thank you for all for joining me today. It is, uh, I'm joined today with uh, Heather White, who will be, as I said, keeping an eye on the chat. Um, and we're going to talk to you a little bit today about mindfulness and pregnancy, why it matters, not just for doulas, but for, I believe, for all birth professionals and really for our clients as well. But I think in the past, when I've talked a little bit about the benefits of mindfulness and, and meditation, it's been focused on our clients. But um, for any doulas who are joining me today, um, burnout is a big issue. Um, vicarious trauma is a big issue. So having some tools in our toolkit to help us, I guess, you know, really manage and regulate our own systems is uh, so important these days. So a little bit about me, I'm, uh, as you can probably tell, I am, although I'm in Texas today, I'm not uh, originally from here, I'm Irish. I uh, did my midwifery training in Ireland and actually my doula training as well. I started the first doula, um, I guess, professional doula service in Ireland quite a while back now. So um, and mindfulness and, and mental health was always kind of part of my interest, especially when it came to maternal health. So I like some of you out there may have I trained as a childbirth educator many, many years ago. And I was always looking for, you know, what's what's new in the space? What's, you know, evidence based? What's really helping our clients have better experiences? And I trained in hypnobirthing originally. And that really yeah, kind of, you know, I guess I it, it, it was an itch I had to scratch. So um, I, le I started learning more and more about, okay, different modalities that could be really helpful for parents adjusting to this huge life transition. And it just felt like when teaching kind of standard childbirth education that we weren't, we were giving, it was a huge knowledge transfer, but not uh, experiential skill that they could be practicing during uh, pregnancy on kind of the little things so that when the big transition comes and the big challenges come, uh, which is often the case with postpartum, that uh, they just really didn't have much in their toolkit to support themselves. So a quick reality check this is what we're going to run through today. Um, we're going to look at defining mindfulness, what it is and what it isn't, some of the myths and misconceptions around it, why it really matters. Um, we're going to look at quickly through the brain basics and um, how mindfulness and meditation impacts the circuitry of the brain in positive ways. We're going to do a quick whistle top tour of the mechanisms of mindfulness, recent evidence uh, and look at any kind of risks because I think before we I guess engage in in any new um, modality in our in our training or in what we're offering information resources that we're offering to parents that we want to make sure that uh, it's a it's safe to offer and then just getting a simple practice started for anyone who is interested in uh, learning more about mindful meditation but you just don't know really where to begin and then some uh, references and resources. So I guess a reality check, um, really just a couple of weeks ago, the US Surgeon General um, shared a, like a, a public health warning on the mental health of parents. So we know that the, the, the state of mental health in the US is not very good. We know that most parents don't have many resources to support their own mental health. And there's so much stigma around it as well. So we've got this, this was what I thought was just fascinating to say that, you know, there, we're issuing a public health warning um, on mental health because parents are so stressed. And, you know, if you're out there at the cold face, you're seeing parents that are, you know, juggling jobs, maybe, elderly parents, they have a new baby on the way, everyone's worried about finances and cost of living. So um, it's not unexpected to see these stress levels, but they are going unchecked now. And, and I think as doulas and birth professionals in the community, we have a great opportunity here to really make a difference in uh, maternal mental health without waiting for the system to change because it's, you know, like, trying to, uh, you know, what, what the saying, throwing deck chairs off the Titanic, uh, waiting on the system to change and, and make really, I guess, uh, meaningful change is not coming anytime soon. So we look at when it comes to maternal deaths in the US, I think like 85% are preventable. And then of course we have the huge uh, mental health challenges um, being the leading cause of maternal death in the USA, uh, followed by cardiovascular disease. So we've got some big challenges, and this is the reality that I would say most of us are, 
are seeing kind of at the coal face out with our clients or at least some of our clients. So it's one of the challenges that we are, our clients are facing. So just like in birth, like in life, stuff happens that we don't choose, stuff that happens that are unwanted. So lots of times we, we get what we don't want and we don't get what we do want. So maybe your client or yourself, maybe you wanted an unmedicated birth and you didn't get it. Um, mom, maybe your client really wants her newborn sleep or newborn baby to sleep more. And we know how that story ends. It usually doesn't happen as quickly as mom would like it to happen. And then we end up down in uh, sleep training. So what's interesting is when we look at some of the, the challenges our clients face between poverty, mental health, unplanned pregnancies, breastfeeding, systemic racism, you can go down the list and there's probably you know a lot more we could add to this list. Um, we can see that there's lots of unwanted happening in uh, in that pregnancy and birth and postpartum experience that we're getting mm. what we don't want. So what we need to understand is that mindfulness can really impact all of these in a positive way. And it's not that mindfulness is a silver bullet or a panacea because it's not going to solve the problems. Not initially anyway, but it's going to help parents relate to those stressors in a different way. And that's really what we want for our uh, our clients that they have a healthier stress response and that we're building this what we call stress resiliency uh, for them during pregnancy so um so they have these tools for life because what look at these the challenges that our clients face there's more challenges coming so you know we know that post birth there's going to be challenges with relationships there could be challenges with our identity with our oh. body so mm -hmm. much um are we I have to make sure we've got everybody muted. Um, so we've got more challenges on the way. We have, uh, so why not give parents some resources and tools that will help them not just through pregnancy, birth and early postpartum, but the toddler years and the teenage years. And uh, I can personally attest to um, using all of these skills with, with teens as well. And it works just as well. So what are the kind of challenges that doulas are facing today? High routine intervention rates, navigating policy, systemic racism, um, emotional burnout and empathy fatigue. I don't, you, somewhere in the research, we got confused between empathy fatigue and compassion fatigue, but compassion uses specific circuitry of the brain, which uh, means we, we need to really kind of reclassify this as empathy fatigue and not compassion fatigue. Then trying to balance advocacy with non-judgment, supporting our clients that may have trauma, supporting clients with complicated pregnancies. And, you know, we're looking at, you know, the state of health in the US at the moment, we're seeing more moms coming into pregnancy with metabolic disease and developing gestational diabetes, um, preeclampsia. And then we have the kind of unpredictability then of uh, actual birth outcomes themselves. So when we define mindfulness, we this is one of the, I guess, the, the what I prefer, you know, there's so many different um, definitions out there, but I do like John Kabat-Zinn's approach. And it is this mindfulness, it's the awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose. So we're, we're directing our attention on purpose into the present moment. So what's happening in our experience right now in a non-judgmentally way. So we're noticing what's happening and we are we are not identifying it. We're not, you know, blaming or shaming. And but we're really paying attention to what is happening in our brain, in our mind at this point in time. And I I, I like to think of it as uh, being the nosy neighbor of your mind. So starting to pay attention with a little bit of curiosity of what is actually happening um, and, and, and noticing patterns of thought that really might not be uh, very helpful as during pregnancy and parenting. So I like to define it as a coping skill that enables a change in the way mom and a partner relate to stressors. So they are going to have stressors in, in postpartum. Um, they're relating to their stressors, their thoughts and emotions in a different way, rather than trying to change the stressor or removing it. 
because I'm sure like many of your clients out there, we they can't change their circumstances. They can't, they and we we can't avoid stress. Um, but this is really what I think the ultimate form of uh, of self-care. But it is it is not a bubble bath for the brain, you know, and I'm sure you're all sick of hearing that, you know, self-care means just taking a nice bath. You know, yes, alone time can be fine, but uh for a new mom, that's probably not very reasonable. And this is not about uh, positive thinking. And I think that's another, I guess, an, an, uh, idea, misconception that uh, around mindfulness that we're just, you know, glossing over the, the difficult bits and you know, acting as if everything is fine and dandy. So this is just a, a quick kind of run through of this. And it is, it is looking at the, the kind of the Buddhist influence on mindfulness. So. And there's kind of good news and there's bad news here. And, and because, you know, originally this, this evolved from, from my, the Western sense of meditation evolved from Buddhist principles, but I'm not trying to change anyone's religion. But Buddhism recognized that most of our unhappiness and stress isn't caused by outside events, but by our own, own, own our reactions to them, how we feel about them. Recognizing that nothing is uh, nothing is permanent. That even though we know, uh, uh, and for anyone who's out there working with postpartum moms, and that those couple of weeks in the beginning are really really hard, but reminding them that that nothing is permanent. That even though this feels really difficult now, each day is likely to get better. And you know, have them think back to a really stressful event. You know, a couple of years ago, that in when you when you're in the middle of it, it felt like oh yeah, this is really really tough, and it feels like this is my life now and it's, this is how it is and nothing's going to change. So when you're caught in that intensity of emotion, um, it can feel like, you know, this is my life now. And uh, but, but we know that nothing is permanent. Everything is changing. Our thoughts and feelings, circumstances will change. Um, reminding ourselves that thoughts are not facts, that we don't need to believe everything we think. And this is really helpful for first time moms that are that might have, you know, concerns about how will they parent? You know, will they be a good mom? It's it's kind of all of those thoughts that I think everybody at some point has uh, has wondered, um, recognizing that we cannot control a lot of external events. Um, and when we can, that's great. We change what we can. But for those things that we can't, we can change our mind and our response to those events. So it is not a panacea. It is not a, a silver bullet, um, but it is a potential part of the solution to improve maternal and infant health. And again, it's not we're not talking about positive thinking. And for any of you who are familiar with uh, the, the poem by Rumi, The Guest House, it's we're not. Differenti differenti differentiating between positive emotions and negative emotions we are allowing emotions to come and go and but we don't stay there so by not staying there in let's just say you know we have the thought that oh will I be a good mom or or the thought even you know a more negative thought I'm not a good mom or you know my baby doesn't you know doesn't I, I've heard my baby doesn't like my breast milk my baby keeps refusing the breast so you can see how that rumination could kind of you know, take us down a really negative rabbit hole. So when we recognize and we were curious and start to inquire about, well, why, why am I thinking that? And where, where's the proof for, for that idea? By not staying there, by just adding a little bit of curiosity, a little bit of inquiry, think of how much, especially for postpartum, how much mental energy we can free up just by using you know I, I get like using uh gratitude compassion self-kindness so we're freeing up a huge amount of mental energy for our for, for especially in postpartum when parents are already exhausted and what we're trying to do is catch those thoughts early on so that we don't spend a lot of time on the uh i always say the a train of thought that's going to uh take you to stress town so a little bit on the myths and misconceptions. Um, so although meditation and mindfulness have been practiced for you know, thousands of years as a part of you know, Buddhism, and um, there's aspects that are found in Hinduism, Stoicism, but what we need to recognize that most religions around the world also include aspects of mindfulness. So patience, grace, um, compassion. So think of these as these are human values, really, not being kind of religious 
values. And the Western secular mindfulness really yeah, focuses on you know, evidence. Uh, and this means that whether you are religious or not, you are, you know, mindfulness is something that you can practice um, safely. So some of the other misconceptions that that mindfulness and relaxation are the same thing. And this this one in particularly, yeah, yeah. I, I need to remain mindful when someone says this to me. I thought oh, it's just mindfulness. Uh, we need to just tell women to relax when they've had their baby and their milk will flow or, or whatever that thought is. And I'm sure you've probably heard it as well, that, that relaxation is the answer to everything. Um, and I, I see this in particular when I'm working with uh, with women who are having fertility difficulties. And that is, for anyone out there who's had fertility challenges, it is like the last thing you ever want to hear. It is so offensive and really, really difficult to hear when someone says, oh, if you just relax, it'll happen. Um, then thought stopping or the idea that, you know, when you're mindful, you just it's about emptying your mind and stopping all thoughts. It's that is like saying, you know, you got to stop breathing. You know, the mind is, you know, continuously and, and with, you know, thoughts and emotions are continuously coming up and trying to stop them is like, yeah, it's saying, you know, we, we've got to stop uh, breathing. So we can't do it, nor should we do it. What we want to do is become, uh, you know, a, a more discerning observer of the mind. So when we are, you know, feeling good and, and thoughts and feelings are, are, you know, more, more positive and more enjoyable, then we know that we're, we're, we're kind of trending in the right direction. So we want more of that. But when we notice that we have taken that train of thought to stress town, that we disembark that, that, that train a little earlier and save the mental energy and that uh, the, the impact on our, our body, our relationships and ultimately our baby. Uh, you do not need a dark room and, and sit in a cross-legged position, that lotus pose. But if you search, if you do a Google search for um, meditation or mindfulness, that's usually what you see. It's some, you know, white, uh, blonde woman sitting cross-legged, you know, out in the woods somewhere, you know, living her best life. You can... There's so many different ways you can meditate. You can, you know, there's uh, yoga, there is mindful movement, mindful walking. Uh, and really all we're doing, when we're, we're, when we're doing mindful movement, we're just paying attention to our the feeling of our movement, our noticing our breath. And as our mind wanders away, we just notice, oh, my mind has wandered off to, you know, getting my, adding to my grocery list. And we acknowledge that and we bring our attention back to that feeling of the movement or the feeling of the, the cushion behind you as you sit on the couch. So we don't need dark rooms. We don't need specific positions. Some people find it helpful. But I think, again, we are working in the real world here and we're helping parents in through pregnancy and, and in pregnancy for the first baby, you might have a little bit of extra time. And if you like to go and, and sit in the dark room and, and do all the, the specific positions, then great. But we're looking at the real life applications of mindfulness uh, with, with parents. And that might mean a mindful moment is, you know, sitting with your baby and just, you know, looking at, you know, being curious about you know, their eyelashes and, and you know, their their smile or their, the touch of their skin, the weight of their body in your arms. So by focusing on, on these, you know, very experiential uh, experiences, we're not, we're kind of crowding out the worry and the negative thoughts. So, and it's a really nice way for us to connect with ourselves and with our babies. Um, the idea that meditators just float blissfully through life and are just never angry. Um, there is, and I think this is this is an interesting one because um, in, in Buddhist traditions, they talk about anger being a poison. It has a, a honeyed tip and a poisoned root. And what that means is, you know, and for any of you who've had this experience where you are thinking about maybe a particular obstetrician who really isn't, is does not, who didn't treat your client very respectfully or, or, and, and, or professionally. And we think, well, you know, in that moment, you know, when I was thinking about when, when that experience happened, that my my anger felt righteous and it really does feel righteous and it feels really good and this is what we talk about with that that honey tip it feels good that anger feels really good but then it has the poison root so then we are dealing with the aftermath of that and the the focus uh the the changing of our physiology based on how long we spend 
in that uh, thinking about that experience and coming back to that experience, you know, a time and time again, just, you know, it triggers that uh, physiological change in our in our brain and uh, in our body. And then the idea that meditators just become numb or, or, or passive to injustices. I really feel so strongly here that anyone with, if you have an activist bone in your body, and I have plenty of them, um, that this is a really important skill for you. And, and I think, you know, many of us, you know, in the doula world, we feel like, you know, just being a doula is uh, is, is almost a, an active, you're being an activist within within the, uh, you know, the dreadful maternity services in the US. But when you are um, managing your emotions, when you're able to regulate your emotional state, it just means that you can be an activist for a lot longer. So we keep doulas working with parents for a lot longer. That means we're not burning out and, and, and leaving the work because we uh, we're, we're finding the the act of the you know trauma sometimes for ourselves quite difficult, and just watching how uh, sometimes how how moms are treated. So a simple inquiry. So for so if you never sat and, and and practiced mindfulness ever in your life, I would say yeah, think of it as a way to cope with unknown unwanted events, and without even doing any mindfulness, asking simple questions. You know, and I think these are really helpful. Uh, I think especially in postpartum, is this thought helpful? And this is based on some of the work by uh, Byron Katie. Is the thought helpful? Is it true? Sometimes it will be true but oftentimes it won't be. How do I act when I believe that thought? And then can you think of one stress-free reason to keep believing this? And how would I behave if I didn't believe that thought? How would I behave around my partner, around my baby, around my friends and family if I didn't believe that thought, especially if it's a thought about that involves around shame or... Um, negative thoughts about yourself, about your, you know, postpartum body or, you know, your worthiness as uh, feeling worthy as a, as a new mom that's worthy of, of support and, and care. And that idea of, I think in postpartum, we often feel like we should be coping and we should be coping better or my partner should be helping out more. So I think that is a really helpful exercise when we have those, you know, an attack of the shoulds um, and it's, uh, I've heard that, you know, that the saying around should, that it is, um, it's a could with shame added to it. So uh, without even doing any mindfulness, these couple of questions to practice just yourself before you ever sit down to, uh, to, to do any kind of little bit of mindful breathing, focus on, is the thought helpful? Is it true? How do I act when I believe that thought? And then think of one stress-free reason to keep believing this. And how would you behave if you didn't believe that thought? So why does it matter? Well, mindfulness helps parents cope when unwanted things happen and when wanted things do not happen. I really like this uh, image here. It says, you know, because you never hear new mother saying, I can't stop thinking all these happy thoughts. I am just so excited. So that's usually not what we're hearing in postpartum. So a little bit about meditation and how it changes the brain. So it has the potential to change the structure of our brain um, in pregnancy and outside of pregnancy as well, but specifically in pregnancy because we have this wonderful nine month window of enhanced neuroplasticity. So let's look at the maternal and fetal brain. So we know pregnancy is a time of accelerated neuroplasticity. There's lots of changes happening to prepare us for motherhood. Um, this development stage of maternal brain, it's influenced by internal and external environments. So our internal environment, essentially our physiology, our thoughts and our feelings, and then our external environment as well. But it structurally changes neural circuitry. And one really important benefit it is that it increases the real estate within the brain that is associated with positive mood. And it also reduces activity in that whole fight or flight center of, of the, uh, the amygdala, those two almond shaped organs that are uh, that we have in the brain. 
And when I'm um, when we see a lot of activity in an area of the brain, a lot of blood flow to that area, we see, the, see those areas grow in real estate. So that's great when it's associated with positive mood. Um, but when it comes to those amygdala, I, I joke with with uh, with my clients and say, hey, I, you know, I'm all about body positivity and um, and no shame. But I said, I really want you to have a skinny amygdala two skinny amygdala as we're going into labor and birth. So that means they're not activating that fight or flight response very often. So uh, that's a really nice kind of side effect of meditation. And then our babies, they are also influenced by the environment. And that and their environment is our body. It's, it's the hormones they're exposed to. It's the nutrition that they are exposed to. So that is, and, that, and and sometimes when when I do chat to parents about this and when I, when I present with other providers, there is, is usually when the question comes up that it's like, oh, this is yet another stick for mothers to, to beat ourselves up with. And I think it's just, you know, years ago we thought smoking was okay. And, and now we know that it's not so good for mom and it's not so good for baby. So I think we have to recognize that, yes, we, so many moms cannot avoid the stressors in their lives. So we're not we're not telling these moms, oh, you can just quit your job, go wrap yourself up in cotton wool and just go live on a you know beautiful beach somewhere while you're and you know while you're you know growing your baby. That's not happening. So again, we're back to kind of real life situation. How can we you know support moms to to understand that their emotional state is influencing the growth of their the architecture really of their baby's brain but we can do it in a way that is you know sharing knowledge without shaming anyone and it's really just about helping them start to notice that this is something that a really really like incredible gift that they can give to their baby is to start um like practicing emotion regulation during uh, during pregnancy so a little bit more on, you know, meditation changes physiology. So it's not just, you know, a nice thing to have that, you know, makes us feel good and, and keeps our mood more positive. So it increases, as I mentioned, it increases the neuroplasticity in the brain by increasing BDNF, reduces blood glucose levels. So for anyone who is uh, has moms who may have higher risk for gestational diabetes or just in general for reducing our blood glucose because that ha that's what happens when we're in that fight or flight response. We are mobilizing resources to fight or to flee. So when we're more emotionally regulated, more balanced, we're not seeing those increases in blood glucose. Improved blood pressure regulation. And this is uh, quite well seen in the uh, cardiovascular uh, literature increases oxytocin. So there is some lovely literature out there on self-compassion practices for increasing oxytocin. And then these are all really nice ways that again, moms are supporting their physiology and uh, babies also. The reduction of stress hormones, that fight or flight activation, it also modulates the maternal microbiome again, by just reducing the time we spend in that stress response and, and giving us when we're not in that stress response, we have our executive functioning is back online so we can make, you know, informed decisions when uh, if we need to make uh, decisions in labor. And then understanding again, the unborn infant brain is also being influenced by mom's, uh, the environment of mom's body. And then postpartum, there's also changes in breast milk volume and even composition. So there's a recent study uh, recently just on um the HMOs of breast milk and looking at uh, differences in cortisol and even fat levels. So there is so much that's that we're not really talking to parents about when we talk about mindfulness because we've kind of kept it from kind of above the neck. So there's a couple of specific evolutionary default settings. And these are like brain or factory settings of your phone. Um, and they just make pregnancy and postpartum a lot more challenging. So they are evolutionary, they're default settings. So all we wanna do is just create awareness around them so that when it happens, we are aware and we can spend less time in that stress response. So 
the one of the first ones is the negativity bias. So the negativity bias is just, you know, the brain is always on the lookout for threats. It is, and it assumes a threat, something is a threat before we've even had a chance to actually process the information because it takes a very much a better safe than sorry response. So we have, so if you are um, out in uh, foraging for, for berries, you know, 100,000 years ago uh, when we were, you know, hunter gatherers and you heard a rustling in the bushes, you would automatically think tiger, not hamster. Because if your brain's default was, oh, it could be a hamster and it was a tiger, then we're, we're looking at, okay, evolutionary, we want to make sure, like the brain, one of the, the brain's most important kind of functions is survival. So it is biased towards anything it perceives as a threat. So we have that negativity bias and, and it's, it's, it is a, it's almost a disorder of the brain that it's negatively kind of trying to predict the future. So when we're in present moment and, and kind of being in the present moment, we start to notice where is our mind going when we're not watching? And does it automatically go to that worst case scenario? And then just recognizing that, oh, this is just an evolutionary setting in the brain, but now I know about it. So I can see that my brain is just gonna be biased towards negative stuff. And, and I can recognize that. And again, don't stay in that stress response for very long. And then we have, the wandering mind. So most of the time, like 50% of the time, our, it's expected that our brain are gone someplace else. You know, while you're sitting here today, you're probably, you know, there's 10 other things that are on your mind that uh, you're thinking I need to go do, or it's, you know, it's you got to pick up kids from school, whatever is going on in your, in your life. So the mind is constantly wandering. Wandering itself is not a bad thing. You know, wandering can, can, can be really helpful when we're talking about like, you know, you know, ideas and innovation and creation. Um, but oftentimes the this wandering takes us to stress town. If our minds wandering took us to tropical beaches and beautiful waterfalls, and uh, that would just elicit a really nice relaxation response in the body and not negativity in the stress response. But the brain tends again to wander off to places that are associated with that uh, with stress. So understand that the brain did not evolve for happiness. It didn't evolve for contentment or bliss. It evolved for survival. So experiences that are considered important or protective in the opinion of the brain, it will focus on those areas. So we just have to work a little bit harder when we're having, when, when positive experiences, are, when we're experiencing something positive, because the brain is really not interested in the positive things because it's like, oh, that's not important. That's not going to keep me safe. So it focuses, it tries to direct you over to the negative, that bias. So quick look at the different mechanisms of mindfulness. So there is attention regulation. So you may have heard the saying, you know, where attention, you know, where attention goes, our energy flows. So being mindful, literally, of where we are putting our attention in any given moment. Um, noticing then, you know, based on that atten attention, um, how are our emotions? So if we are focused on, you know, the, the growing cesarean rate in our local hospital, and we find ourselves ruminating on how can we change it? Maybe we can't change it. And just feeling despondent and, and, and being hard on you know, ourselves and, and disappointed in the system, we start to notice that, that our thoughts are, are taking us down that uh, kind of rabbit hole of, of negative thoughts. So we can stay there or we can, again, notice this is not really good for me. It's not good for my, my physiology. So we're going to you know, change, literally change the thought we're accepting of the thought, but we are not going to spend a huge amount of time and, and that mental and, and physiological energy in that space. And then noticing then how does our body react when we're in each state? So we're in a state of we have attended to our, our, our attention is on a specific aspect. Maybe it's breastfeeding. And as a, a new mom, when I think of, you know, looking forward to breastfeeding my baby, how does that feel in my body? And um, it's a somatic experience as well as, you know, that knowledge transfer. And then there's that change in perspective of self. So is there a way that we can be more gentle with ourselves? And, and again, back to those self-compassion practices, which are just phenomenal for, for new moms. 
um, dealing with, you know, postpartum body, you know, our, and our identity and shame and feelings about the birth itself and, uh, and our feelings about motherhood. So there are, these are, there's like several cognitive and neurobiological processes that are happening. So where is my focus? You know, in gentle birth, we, we, we talk about, you know, you know, right now is, is what I'm focused on making me more excited about my upcoming birth or more anxious. And that thought alone will, will help you realize, okay, so maybe I should come off Facebook for a minute because all those birth stories are, are, have really upset me. Or someone wants to tell you a birth story that you can, you know, decline and say, oh yeah, no, because I really want to focus on activities, um, thoughts, emotions, uh, you know, internally and external activities that are going to make me more excited about my baby's birth. And not more anxious. So it actually puts the power really back into parents' hands. So in the in the perinatal period, I like to think of uh, mindfulness as being like being a gardener of the mind. So think of your mind as you know over the years, there's various seeds have been planted, seeds that you know about our you know worthiness of good things of of being happy, and we probably didn't notice when these seeds were being planted. And sunshine just makes everything grow. And our attention can be like sunlight. So it doesn't discriminate. So we have to shift our attention from things that we don't want to things that we do want, things that are going well. Um, and there's always a way to, uh, to find something that is going well in our lives. It is so easy to, to focus on what's going wrong. Um, but I think when you wake up in the morning, say, well, well, today, what is going right for me? So that's why when we talk about mindfulness, you often hear the saying that we're cultivating mindfulness. So it is not a one and done. It is it takes a consistent practice. Um, we all grew up thinking that this, you know, chaos in our minds is normal and we have to learn really to to be brave and to not identify with those thoughts. So it mindfulness allows us to give, it gives us a little gap between what's happening and being able to step out and step back so that we don't identify with those uh, thoughts and emotions. Um, in Ireland, in, in the Irish language, there is like, we would say, um, I am sad. So in English we would say, I am sad, but it, in, that translates into Irish as, which translates into there is sadness on me not I am sad so there's sadness on me so that again gives us that little bit of distance and so that we don't identify with the emotion so the evidence for mindfulness of pregnancy it, there's a couple of um, systematic reviews out there and this is kind of you know an overview of what we're seeing reduced fear of childbirth reduced pain catastrophizing um, and that being, you know, the um, some of you may have heard it before with clients that will say, oh, I know I'll be the only one, you know, screaming like a banshee. And 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 we know that pain catastrophizing almost increases a, a mom's chances of of needing um, pain medication. So reduced need for medication, increased childbirth efficacy. They feel more confident improved stress response in infants at six months. So this was a really fascinating study done in, uh, I think it was in San Francisco a couple of years ago. And these moms had a, I think it was a eight weeks of practice, um, practicing simple mindfulness techniques throughout the day. And it changed their baby's stress response. So the babies had a healthier stress response and, and came back to baseline a lot sooner. We also see a reduction in mood disorders and uh, relapse, especially around depression. And the idea that it acts as a buffer to trauma. And, and I've seen that my, personally myself with, with moms who on paper might have had a very challenging experience, um, but they come away from it without identifying with the experience, without blaming themselves for the experience. Um, and, and, and being able to, when, if something is happening, you know, it, maybe uh, in L&D that day that, that we don't automatically, you know, say, oh, well, you know, that nurse is mean or that nurse, you know, doesn't care about me. That when we can step out of that stress response, we can think a little bit more clearly and recognize that, oh, you know, it is like a full 
the board is full out there. It's a really busy day for that, you know, that nurse. And we're trying to offer her compassion and offer uh, some compassion to ourselves as well. So when we look at postpartum, we consider postpartum a predictable crisis. So we know it's coming. So one aspect of mindfulness, again, that, that kind of ties in with the misconceptions as well, is that we are never telling a mom who is distressed that she needs to go and meditate, that she needs to go sit on the cushion, you know, the dark room, all of that idea. This is not what we're doing with, with a mom who's having an emotional crisis. So meditation is never going to replace support um, or mental health professional care. So what we were doing is we're helping those moms navigate those thoughts in a healthier way. So, um, and I, as again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, so many people are, so many moms are just, you know, sent out into the world, especially if you're looking at breastfeeding education with relaxation skills. So if you just relax, you know, your milk will flow. And it, again, you know, breastfeeding will be easier. And then looking at them with mental health being one of the leading cause of maternal death, and then all we're sending parents home with are relaxation skills and the advice to, you know, surround yourself with supportive people and, and get support. Go to your, your local um, breastfeeding support group. But the reality is for, for a lot of these moms, support is not coming. So we are leaving these parents, literally, we're, we're kind of leaving them out to dry with uh, with no skills to support them in, in probably the biggest transition of their adult lives. And I think one thing as well, when uh, we're talking about mental health is that a lot of childbirth educators as well will, will figure, you know, they decide, oh, I'm not a, a mental health specialist and, and, and teaching mindfulness does not make you a mental health specialist either. Again, it's just, a, it's a tool that we can share with parents and share resources where parents can access those tools and, uh, and learn about them. And just as a as a note on that, so most of the early mindfulness uh, uh, studies that were done in the US were on uh, disadvantaged disadvantaged uh, women. There were some really nice studies in um, couple studies in San Francisco where these moms had were significantly disadvantaged, and because they're again the the, the idea that. We know what who was the research done, but they did do a lot of this early research um, on uh, black and brown women, and we know that their uh, outcomes are you know significantly worse than the U.S. So a really simple way to um, that will again will help parents when it comes to breastfeeding is again noticing the thoughts, and we have the autopilot. So autopilot being mindlessness. So if you can see kind of you know both sides here. So the first thought is. My baby always seems hungry. Is he getting enough milk? And you can see the train of thought and that rabbit hole that mom is going down. Maybe my milk isn't giving him what he needs. And then it gets worse. What if I'm starving him? And I, I mean, I've had these thoughts. I had these thoughts on my first. Um, before I knew more about breastfeeding, before I knew more about, you know, how my, I shouldn't really believe everything I'm thinking. So when we look at the right-hand side, then we have, okay, so if we just start noticing our thoughts, and the thought remains the same. My baby always seems hungry. So the next question is, well, I'm noticing that I'm having the thought that my baby's always hungry. So just by adding in that language of I'm noticing that I'm having the thought, I'm not identifying with that I'm starving my baby, but I'm noticing that I'm having this thought. And then I'm asking, like, is this thought helpful? It might be. Well, it's we're, we're adding that inquiry. Well, he is having lots of wet and dirty diapers and he's gaining weight. But maybe I'll ask at the my mom's the mom's breastfeeding group. So it is taking that it's a step at a time that I'm decide I are not identifying with the thought. I'm asking is the thought helpful? And then just taking that, it, it takes us out of that stress response and that out of that that spiraling. Because as, as you see on the left hand side, it it, it turns into it starts at my baby is always hungry to I'm not enough. I'm a terrible mom and something is really wrong with me. So this is really where I, where I feel kind of the, the rubber meets the road. And you can see which approach is likely to help your clients reach their breastfeeding goals. So all we're doing is we are interrupting 
this habit of thought and, and the earlier we can start doing this in pregnancy the better so it doesn't become this whole kind of process that we're doing it's, it's almost instant we're interrupting that habit of thought we're adding just a dash of curiosity and we're turning down that stress response um and noticing again like noticing where our attention is what's happening in the body and emotionally regulating ourselves and then um and it changes then how we see ourselves as moms we've gone from something is wrong with me and i'm a terrible mom to really keeping that executive functioning online so we can think really clearly and go ask questions at that uh, breastfeeding group so just a quick i know we're we're flying out of time here um, some of the mindfulness and education, childbirth education studies that are out recently. And there's a couple of these that compared um, Lamaze with a mindfulness based class. So they showed three months postpartum um, changes in um, depressive scores. That was in this was a 2021 20, study and showing better social uh, emotional development uh, compared with infants. These are babies in the Lamaze group, as well as mom's response as well. Um, again, looking at perceived stress and perinatal depression, randomized to mindfulness group or the Lamaze group, and they showed better outcomes with um, mindfulness group. And for anyone out there who is you know, teaching in the mass or any childbirth ed, I just feel like we're at a point now where we know too much that we need to start finding ways that we can add these tools to our curriculum so that we can give parents a really well-rounded education that's not just on knowledge transfer. Um, this was um, from 2016, the I Changed My Mind study, looking at uh, moms with a high fear of, child, uh, fear of childbirth. So mindfulness participants were 36% less likely to have an epidural, less likely to have a planned cesarean, cesarean, and twice as likely to have an unmedicated birth, and newborn scores were higher as well. Um, this was the gentle birth paper that was uh, just published last month. So moms were using the app and we looked at, and this was actually during COVID. So what they what we found was the more time they spent practicing within the app, um, the more se birth self-efficacy they experienced, higher rates of coping, lesser rates, uh, lower rates of cesarean births and epidural use. So real world applications of mindfulness, this is kind of from moms, like in their own words, and this is from some of the research papers. So a parent of a baby in NICU, she says, I would say for me, meditating really helps me when I'm in a place where I'm extremely anxious over something I cannot control. Uh, one of our mantras at Gentle Bird is control the controllables. So again, helping moms recognize that there are external events we cannot control, but we can control our inner experience when, uh, when these things are happening. Postpartum body image. Um, this mom said, well, I still looked, you know, I looked like five months pregnant. And uh, I have a little practice of when I notice my belly saying to myself, you know, that's a beautiful place where your child came from, reminding myself of what women's bodies are supposed to do and what they're supposed to look like when you're postpartum. Relationships. This is a really big one for, uh, especially for, for first time parents. It was really good for reminding me about compassion towards my partner, towards my husband, who is probably more scared about being a parent than I am and has all kinds of other stuff going on. I think I've been able to remain mindful of that stuff, you know, for him and take a deep breath to find compassion for what his situation is before I assume that he's doing something on purpose to irritate me. And that is something that um, a lot of, you know, I think first time parents, I know I did it as well, that you're all kind of keeping score. Who, who's the who's the most tired, you know, who's getting up with the baby next and uh, I think, again, that that mindful awareness of, you know, it's like that our partner is probably struggling to maybe not as much as we are, um, but offering, you know, again, ourselves that little bit of compassion and uh, our partners because they're struggling. This is new for them, too. Um, on birth trauma. So it did make me feel a little bit more physically powerful in a way that I hadn't expected or thought about, even though I didn't have the vaginal birth. Just the fact that I could get through labor and, you know, without any kind of intervention up until the point when I had to have the C-section, it's like, I can do this. And that's great. And I definitely give credit to mindfulness, my mindfulness class for that feeling and also for not feeling bad about having a cesarean birth. 
Overwhelm, so common in postpartum. I was able to separate myself from that feeling of overwhelm when you're really tired and you have a lot of demands from a little person who you really want to help, but you aren't sure how to help. And doing that exercise is a mental way of putting your baby down and walking away without actually having to do that. I think this is so helpful as we you know, tie it back into that um, public health crisis that we're experiencing now with mental health and, and the stress that parents are under. This is a way for them to put the baby down without actually putting the baby down. So what are some of the risks around mindful meditation? When we look at the risks of meditation, in general, what we're looking at is these uh, issues tend to come up when we are when someone goes off and does like, you know, a 10 day silent retreat. So if we're sitting practicing with the breath, if you've never done any breath work before, sometimes it can actually bring up a little bit of anxiety. So we always start low and slow. And I set the bar really low that we're just going to meditate or practice mindful breathing for like one minute today. That's all we're going to do. We're going to keep the bar really low. And that is just focusing on noticing the breath coming in and out of the body. Where do I feel it the most in my chest? Can I notice it here at the tip of my nose? Do I feel the air going in, you know, into my throat? Um, what does it feel like? And as you have those thoughts of focusing on the feeling of the breath, you know, 20 different thoughts are going to come up about your the grocery, you know, picking up kids or whatever that, that issue is. And you notice it and you bring your mind gently back to that experience of the breath. And that is the mindful moment. And that's something to celebrate when you notice, oh, I was down and I was down in the target a minute ago in my head, but I recognize that, oh, I'm in target and I'm not practicing my breathing so we can bring our breath back. Um, then looking at sometimes a physical discomfort. So choose, you do not have to sit in that darkened room. You can uh, sit in a posture that, that supports your body. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it is not a substitute for therapy. Um, meditation should never replace therapy or medical treatment for uh, postpartum mood disorders. And it's not a quick fix. I think this is really important to share with parents that I think we're in this um, world that is, we want a quick fix. We want the pill. We want, you know, the, you know, I want to do, you know, a, a 10 minute class and I want to know how to, to meditate that, that pressure to use mindfulness as a solution for overwhelm and stress, it can sometimes just mask deeper issues that, that really can, uh, can do with their uh, support. Uh, so, and then the lack of support and then unrealistic postpartum expectations that moms can have. So to mitigate these risks, that, that moms should adjust their meditation practices to their comfort and ensure that, that this, this is one tool in the toolkit and it does not replace professional support, but it can be an adjunct to professional support. So we come back to what are the benefits of, for doulas? So we've, we've talked a lot about parents and how this can really benefit them. So, so let's look at how it impacts doulas and, and birth professionals. So what are we, so some of the challenges we're facing, high routine intervention rates. So how does mindfulness help with that? Well, it helps us remain non-reactive in the face of unexpected changes and allows us to support families without ourselves becoming emotionally overwhelmed. And I think this, this can be tricky for if you're a brand new doula and because the whole uh, you know, hospital experience can be kind of overwhelming. Uh, navigating institutional policies. So it helps doulas stay grounded and clear thinking and resourceful so that we can help parents advocate uh, well, while maintaining, you know, a, you know, we're grounded and we're cooperative and, you know, helping to keep that respectful relationship within the birth room, emotional burnout, empathy, fatigue, it offers tools for our own self-care, reduces stress, promotes emotional resilience, stress resilience, so that we can stay in this work and support parents without completely depleting ourselves. If you're, you know, if you're, you know, going to a lot of uh, births, you know how physically challenging births can be, especially if it's a long labor. But if it's a physically challenging birth or long labor and there's there's challenges with, with staff or institutional policies, that just adds to um, to our stress levels and, and, and having that emotion, those tools, those skills for emotion regulation can uh, can help us recover that a little bit more quickly then helps us balance advocacy with non-judgment. So it helps us approach situations 
with an open mind and non-judgment. Um, and then supporting clients with trauma or fear, it keeps our, you know, our compassion skills really sharp and attuned. So we are, we have the ability to create that safe um, container, that presence that allows moms to feel heard, for moms to, to show vulnerability and feel reassured. And then unpredictable birth outcomes, again, providing us with that emotional balance, a little bit of mental clarity so that we have the skills to, to regulate our own emotions while continuing to offer that uh, unwavering support to parents. So it's really incorporating the mindfulness into your practice. It helps us navigate all of these challenges with greater patience, with greater resilience and emotional strength. So ultimately that enhances our ability to provide really good care to, uh, to our clients during you know, one of the most transformative experiences of their lives. So a beginner's tip, don't try to be mindful, just be curious. So for the next couple of days, just be curious. Notice where your mind goes when you're on autopilot. You'll probably notice it goes to places that, that you don't want to stay very long. So simple ways you can practice mindfulness without ever sitting on a cushion or a darkened room. Um, a mindful shower is, just, is about paying attention to the experience of noticing the water, noticing the heat, um, the smells, using all of your senses. And I guarantee you, like you are two minutes into that mindful shower and your mind has left the building and is off um, you know, looking, looking for trouble, really. So either it's future pacing, it has gone to something that you're, you're anticipating. And it's, again, it's generally not always that positive or it's replaying uh, something that happened that was not very positive. Again, we're, we're, having, we're just trying to have a shower and we're bringing all of our stress into the shower with us taking our time eating. I always suggest to parents that, you know, as, as a lot of us tend to, you know, eat standing at the counter and, and, and kind of shoveling food into our mouths, um, that we are taking some time to, again, notice the tastes and textures, um, change your silverware with your fork and your, your knife, it'll make you slow down. Mindful teeth brushing, a mindful diaper change. You know, how many diapers are your clients gonna change you know, in those first couple of months, if we can do it a little more mindfully, and we can connect with the baby. And it's not this, um, it, it becomes less mechanistic and routine where it is offers us a chance to uh, connect with our baby. And there's mindful movement, mindful driving. Uh, we can do any really, any uh, activity in a more mindful way. I will actually, this is plays for a little bit. So I'll, um, and, and I'm sure we can uh, share these slides for anyone who wants to see them. So really at Gentle Bird, we want to make a more mindful world so that parental stress is not a public health issue. So we want to support parents to cultivate these important skills for their health and their baby's health. We want to birth professionals to have the resources to continue this work and not burn out, but keep themselves well. We want childbirth educators to consider adding mindfulness content to their curriculum to support parents in their community. So how you can help us here is, is you know, we want to let moms know, especially for moms who are uh, on Medicaid, that they can get access to the Gentle Birth app and, and the class that's within the app for free. So we are, it's and this is kind of a, a recent announcement that the app is there for them to download it is they just put in their Medicaid number. The app is also available to doulas who want to, you know, explore the app. There's plenty of content that is non-pregnancy related because the app actually takes us into there's non-pregnancy content and there's lots of uh, like postpartum as well and women's health and wellness. So we have, there's just a couple of my books and uh, if you have any questions, you can email me or the team. It's team at gentlebert.com and I'm going to stop sharing and yeah, there's some very, sorry, that print is a little bit small. That is a little, uh, some of the references from the studies that we shared today. I hope that was helpful. And it, does anyone have any questions or if you, if anyone has to jump off and want to um, email me, I'm happy to help.
I'm just looking at where people are from. We have Sarah from Columbia, lovely. Dallas, Bakersfield. Does anyone have any questions or Do you feel like you have a, I guess, a, an introduction to, to to mindfulness? I could I could talk about this topic all day. It's one of my my favorite areas of when it comes to birth work because I see how it really does change parents' experiences. I think I've unmuted everyone if anyone has any questions or Heather, could you read the the questions that have been asked on the chat? Yes, I only see one from Rachel, and it's will the women on Medicaid have access to taking courses as well or just be able to download the app? So when they download the app, they will be able to take, we have a uh, childbirth education that is about eight hours worth uh, within the app itself. And they can, uh, they can do it in, uh, sorry, not in the app. They can, uh, it's on a learning platform called Teachable. And you can download the Teachable app if you wanted to learn on the go. But I would, I always recommend that, you know, moms and partners sit down when they have some time and kind of plug their laptop into um, a TV so you can actually have some time to really go through the, the materials in depth, as there are some uh, printouts as well. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, please reach out if you have any questions. We are really, I mean, we see, you see this, what's happening out in your communities. We want to have make sure that everybody has access to these resources. It should not be dependent on uh, affordability. So this is why we really want to make sure that, that the moms who are most vulnerable really do have access to as many resources as possible.